Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're really, really excited tonight. Uh, please help me welcome BHB owner and Snake Bites crazy man, Brian Barczyk. Well, first off, obviously, I want to thank you know Justin and everyone that's involved in the Hurt Society here for bringing me out from Detroit. For those guys that don't know, I came in from Detroit just today, just for you guys flying back out in the morning. Basically, I'm, I'm a little bit of a stand-in. Andrew Wyatt was originally going to be here from USR to talk about the Python law and a few other things. Um, turns out that he had some pressing issues in Virginia, so I'm coming in. I'm going to do a couple things here. First, I'm really versed in the laws and so on that, that we all can talk about. I'm more than happy to talk about that, take questions after my presentation. But we're going to do a short presentation that I like to do uh, because I, you know, I've been around the reptile game for probably 25 years. And things were a lot different 25 years ago. I see some people that may or may not have been in, you know, you're pretty old, you're really old. Um, <laughs> but no, you may or may not have been in it for the last 25 years. But the point is, is that, that things have changed a tremendous amount. And the newcomers, a lot of faces that I see, like these young guys over here, they don't know what it was like before, what we have going on now. And we, we've really gone a long way in the last 25 years. So I want to talk a little bit about that journey and where we've come to now so that you guys can appreciate the path that we've been on and just how cool it is right now and some of the pitfalls of that as well. Afterwards, again, for you guys that don't know me, I keep a collection of about 30,000 snakes. Okay, so we have one of the largest collections in the world of animals. So if you guys have any questions about breeding snakes, about you know our web show, we put out a web show every week. Uh, if you have any questions about that, we're going to do you know some question and answers at the end of this. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about animals, the show, the future of the hobby, laws, everything else like that. So so let's get started. The the t title of this is actually just called the Internet Influence. Okay, and that's basically just how different things have come in the last 25 years. There used to be something that was called Notes from NOAA, and that was the Northern Ohio Association of Herpetologists. Basically, it's just like this society here, but it was founded in Northern Ohio. And, and, and I tell you what, it was amazing. They put out this, this brochure here, it was called Notes from NOAA, and they had a classified ad. Now, when I was about 15 years old, the only people, in, the only way in the world I could find out what other people were working with was Notes from NOAA, believe it or not. They put out a once a month pamphlet that basically just was a classified. And everyone in the Herb community, you know, basically did, you know, just couldn't wait for notes to, for Noah to show up because you never knew what you were going to see. Maybe it was going to be a boa constrictor or something else that you just didn't see anywhere. Again, there was no internet. So you couldn't go on Facebook <coughs> or, or kingsnake.com or Fauna Classified. And so, so this was really the only way. And it was a really exciting thing for me as a kid to see, wow, this, I can actually buy this. But, um, but you know, so, so that was really cool. But then, probably once things started to pick up in the reptile community, really brochures and price lists were, were the next step in the evolution of the, the way we sold animals. Because you've got to remember, prior to 25 years ago, there was no hobby. People didn't buy and sell snakes. They basically horse traded with other people. You knew someone that, that was in the hobby, and you said, hey, you know, I just produced <coughs> Brazilian rainbow boas, and you produced Burmese python. Let's just trade them out, right? Well, this is an evolution that happened within the industry that's really grown to where it is today. And this was the next thing was brochures. And I tell you what, again, probably once a month, big companies used to put out these brochures. And it was pretty amazing because you would see the craziest things on these brochures. Like I remember there was a company called Herb de Fauna down in, in Florida. Some of you people are shaking your heads so you know who Herb de Fauna was. They used to put out stuff that was so cool. We'd get it in, and, and I worked at a pet shop when I was 15 years old. I couldn't wait to get the Herb de Fauna brochure because it would have things like 18-foot croc, you know, crocodile. Super tame, can ride on its back. And it would have like, you know, 100 bucks or something like that. Or they sell green anacondas, you know, $5 a foot. You know, and it was just crazy <laughs> the stuff that, that these, these brochures were like. And this was really the standard of all 
you know, reptile companies back then, because you've got to remember, there was no email, there was no internet, there was no Facebook, there was none of that type of stuff. So this was basically the state of the art. And, and like I said, there were tons and tons of people that put them out, some really big names. You know, Tom Crossfield, you guys might have heard of him, VPI International. These were all people back, in, and again, these dates are like, you know, 1990, 92, you know, so way back then, people were putting out these price lists, and that was the only way that we could really communicate. And it was a lot of times with the breeders like BPI here, you can basically see this was 1995 to 1996 winter price list. That was basically a projection of what they thought they were going to have, have that year in production. So it's really exciting to see. Again, we couldn't communicate via email or via you know websites to say, hey, what are those guys working with down there? We had to actually, you know, get these lists and say, wow, I didn't even know they had that. And it was really an exciting time. Certainly not as exciting as, as Facebook and, and Twitter and all those other things are now. And even us, BHB, got into the game in the early 90s. This is a 2000 price list from us. And it's kind of just funny to look at it because it's just so so pathetic. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, this is the type of stuff that we put out in 2000. And, and, uh, and it was a big thing. But I want to step back for one second and talk about the process of getting snakes back 20 years ago or 15 years ago even. And really there was only two ways you could buy a snake. You could either go to a reptile show, and now let's just step back one second. Were there even reptile shows 20 years ago? The truth is there weren't. There were only a couple reptile shows in the entire country that sparked up about 20, 21 years ago. And there was no, now there's a show every weekend somewhere else in the country. A lot of times there's two or three shows the same weekend all around the country. Really, to be honest with you, the notes from Noah actually sparked the very first reptile show. And it was actually in a guy's basement in Columbus, Ohio, a guy named Rick Harvey. It was the very first reptile show ever in the country. It then spawned into to a place called Millersport, Ohio, and then ultimately the National Reptile Breeders Expo down in Orlando, that is now Daytona, sparked from that. As a matter of fact, Wayne Hill, the guy that puts on the expo, actually visited Millersport, Ohio, so that he could start his show down in Florida. So that gives you an idea. So, so shows weren't very prevalent, but it was a way you could buy your animals. If you couldn't go to a show, which again, there's only one or two a year, the only other way to buy it was to ship it on a plane. You know, again, this wasn't an easy task. You know, number one, you had to be a verified shipper with Delta, Northwest, whatever the, the company was. And the problem with it is, is that the weather had to be just right. If it was below 20 degrees, they wouldn't accept animals. So basically, when you were buying an animal, you might have to wait two or three or four months because you have to wait until the weather got good. So, you know, as a business, as we're trying to grow our business, it's kind of a little bit restrictive when someone calls up in December and says, hey, I want to buy this ball python. And go, all right, yeah, send me the money and I'll send it to you probably like March or April. Well, you know, obviously you're not going to get a tremendous amount of sales that way, right? You know, people aren't that patient, especially in this economy and this kind of thing <laughs> that we're in now where things happen quick. But literally, snakes on a plane were really the, the standard thing for a long, long time. And it really held our business back, in all honesty, because we were always restricted by the airlines. But then, and this is where it gets fun, and you guys know about this, the birth of the Internet. And there was actually a, a website that was called the Internet Jungle. And what was interesting, this was the very first reptile website ever. And it was a guy in, in Chicago that put it out. And we actually had a page on the Internet Jungle, and so did a bunch of other breeders. But what's so funny is it was so early on that I didn't even have an Internet service provider. I never saw my first, very first website because I didn't have a computer that actually could get on the web. You know, so I, I still don't know what it looked like, but what's really interesting is that this guy was so far ahead of the curve that he could have been like the biggest website, you know, out there, but he was just a little bit too ahead of the curve. The next website that really came out that set the precedent was kingsnake.com. Now, you guys know about kingsnake.com? Have you guys ever been on it and stuff like that? Okay, the vast majority. Um, Kingsnake.com was actually started by a guy named Jeff Berenger down in Texas, and it, it actually is just like it sounds. It was started for king snakes. It was actually started for gray banded king snakes. West Texas is really known for king snake, you know, their gray banded king snake hunting. And, and this group of people just wanted a website that they could come, post pictures, you know, do their thing, and, and, and so he started Kingsnake.com. But the timing was perfect. You know, it was right when the internet, you know, AOL dial-up started to come out and people were like, oh wow, I can get on the internet now. And then all of a sudden, kingsnake.com was the standard 
website. And now, of course, you know, there's thousands and thousands of classifieds and they get millions of people visiting the site. But Internet Jungle was actually the, the predecessor to that. And then, of course, over the next several years, the, uh, you know, everyone has a website now, right? I mean, how many people in this room have websites? Probably not necessarily even just for snakes, just anything, right? I mean, anyone can have a website. It's super easy. And that's really the standard thing. And now, you know, these websites are so incredible because you can put out information immediately about, you have a clutch hatch this morning, it's on the website this afternoon. You know, so it's just a completely different world how it evolved because, again, if you we look back on my presentation, you know, it was... It could have taken a month or two to get the word out that you hatched a Burmese python. You know, now you can do it in a matter of minutes, really, which is, is really amazing. So I just want you guys to understand that, that you know, how far the industry has come and why it's exploded. Because a lot of people ask, why are reptiles so popular? Because trust me, 20 years ago, when I started out, there was no professional reptile breeders. You know, when I started out as a reptile guy, I didn't think I was going to breed snakes for a living. I could have never imagined that because no one bred snakes for a living. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a farcity. No one could ever think to do that. So we always had all these restrictions. But the biggest thing, as the Internet came out, the biggest problem we still had was we were still relying on Delta and Northwest. You know, you could still only ship those animals during certain months of the year. And by the way, it wasn't just cold, it was hot too. You guys know out here it gets pretty hot in the summer, I'm sure. You know, if it's over 85 degrees, they would just not accept your shipment. So you're really, really doing it. So, so this is what really started to, to set the precedence for the hobby to explode the way it did now. And that was FedEx and UPS. And that only happened about 10 years ago. And about 10 years ago, some people in the reptile business really pushed FedEx and UPS to start carrying overnight shipments of reptiles. That way, you don't have to go to your airport to pick up a ship. You know, think about it. If you live three hours away from the Reno airport, you know, how many times are you going to want to order reptiles and have to drive all the way to Reno to pick them up, right? It's just it's going to be a hassle. Now, FedEx and UPS ships right to your door overnight, you know, it's that easy. And that's really what started the extreme explosion of the reptile hobby. And, 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 and that really, I actually personally attribute the FedEx UPS thing to the biggest growth of the hobby. So let's take a look at the way things happen now. It's a new way of doing business. And this is, again, because of the internet. And, and so, you know, you're going to call me up and you're going to say, hey, Brian. Do you have a pastel ball python? I need a female. And I'm going to say, well, hang on one second. I've got, or that's, uh, sorry, this picture says pied. I'm, I messed that up. All right, you got to come. <laughs> yeah, hey, man, hang on one second. I run out here with my iPhone. Bam, I take a picture of my pie ball ball python. You go, holy cow, Brian, I love it. How much do you want it, you know, for that animal? I say, well, you know, give me 700 bucks. You go, all right, I'm going to PayPal you that right now. Okay, next thing you know, I'm packing it up and it's on a plane, and it's to your door the next day. You see how different things have kind of become in the last 20 years, how I explain how different it is? And, and really, you guys that are into reptiles now have a huge advantage over guys like me that started out when I was younger and didn't have these resources. We didn't have the information that we now have. Herb societies like this were really vital to all the information that was going out. That's why it's awesome when I see a group of people like you guys that are so you know, passionate about animals that you're willing to come together because this is really the grassroots part of it. But the truth is, is now the majority of these types of gatherings are happening on the internet, right? And how many people, when you're buying you know, reptiles nowadays, never even communicate with someone on the phone, right? I mean, it happens to me all the time. I'd say probably 80% of the snakes I sell, 100% is done over email. You know, people just don't want to get on the phone anymore. It's easy. You can send emails day and night, you know. And that's really, emails are, you know, they rule the day, just like I said here. It's easy to get information. You can get information any time of the day or night. If you have a question, you don't have to go, oh, it's, you know, he lives on East Coast time, so it's midnight there, and it's only 9 o'clock here, and, and I can't call him. You can just fire off an email. I'm going to get it in the morning, and I'm going to do it. I still really prefer to talk to people on the phone when I'm selling snakes. You know, I mean, I, I really like to have a personal reaction or connection with them. But the truth is, is that most people just don't really like that. You know, they want to do emails, and emails real a day, and hey, I'm all about emails. That's all cool. Now, another big part of it, and I went too far there, then... The previous frame actually talked about social media. And these guys have been messing with me all day about my, my Twitter addiction. And, uh, and uh, I think social media is incredible. And I think social media is really another thing that's changed 
the reptile industry. How many people in here have Facebook accounts? Okay, now this is the big question. How many people have Twitter accounts? It's like three. Okay, <laughs> follow me at Snake by Steve. Uh, <laughs> no, I love Twitter. I'm a Twitter addict. I tweet, tweet all day long. I think it's the best, the best thing out there. But also Facebook, a tremendous amount. Facebook is really popular. It's a really great way to get out. It's a great way to not only get your message out, it's a great way for you to communicate with people, ask questions about people, and find out just what kind of a person someone is before you're doing it. Again, Twitter is exactly the same as Facebook. It's just only for the cool few people over here. So you guys don't deserve it. Uh, no, it really, it really, it's the same type of thing. But there's also a lot of blogging, obviously, that goes on now. You know, blogging is a big part of the thing. I do a lot of blogging. You know, get things out. If there's a specific topic I want to talk about, I write an article about it, and people can read it. It's a great way to do it. And then, lastly, and some of you guys may may realize, you know, we do a web show. You know, I do a web show out of my, my facility called Snake Bites TV. And we actually started it four years ago. And the whole premise of starting Snake Bites TV was actually because we wanted to reach people, okay? And, and, and I'm not talking really you guys as much because if you, if you guys are hardcore reptile people, you know, we already, you know, we can educate you and we can inform you on things and, and we can all learn. But the fact is we wanted to reach outside of you people and reach the main community. And, 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 and again, you know, things like this Python ban wouldn't happen as much, right? Because if people changed their perception of reptiles and thought these things are actually really cool, maybe these laws and bans wouldn't quite happen, as well as we can expand our hobby and industry. And that's what Snake Bites TV started on. Now, when I started the show four years ago, I thought that we were going to do somewhere between six and ten shows, and that was going to be it, about six or ten weeks. Now we are over 200 weeks later. We, we haven't missed a week, and we're, you know, we get over a million people a month watching the show. So it's pretty amazing how far it's come, but we have a long way to go. But again, it's all part of social media and using YouTube. Uh, me and Justin, you know, uh, there you are. Uh, we shot some stuff that'll be on YouTube, you know, sometime pretty soon. So keep an eye on it. I mean, everything. You know, this obviously we're shooting video that'll probably be on YouTube right now. So it's great. You know, all the social media is a great thing. Another avenue of the internet and how it's changed the industry is in the hobby is is forums. Does anyone does anyone go on forums, reptile forums? What's your guys' favorite forums? What? What is it? Beardy.org? Anybody cool else? Com. <laughs> You're not on that. Are you just on the forums? Chameleon forums? Chameleon forums? Okay. Yeah, okay, so obviously the great thing about chameleons and bearded dragons, and especially the same <coughs> thing, leopard geckos. Uh, you know, you name it. You know, you can get on with like-minded people, just like we're doing here. Although this is a much more general meeting because you're just reptile lovers. You might have frogs, you might have lizards, you might have snakes. It's really cool that forums can can get together and and, and, and share information. And, and you know, it's a great thing. It's a great place to get together and learn stuff because we all agree probably that education is the biggest part of our hobby. We have to educate. We talked earlier today about, you know, if you didn't know something, you weren't going to sell it, which I think is great. We need to educate people. But is everything good and positive about forums? If anyone's been on forums for a length of time, do you ever have any problems on them? Yeah. You know, see, this guy's smart over here. Um, you know, forums aren't always great, okay? And there's a couple problems with the forums. Number one, you get people that pose as experts that aren't necessarily experts, okay? You know, anyone can jump on and say, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a hilarious YouTube video, and I don't know what the name of it is, but I hope you guys can find it sometime. And it's about a gecko breeder that claims to be an expert, and it's a cartoon, and he basically says, well, of course I know everything because I've had 1,300 posts on gecko.com. You know, and that's my point, is like, somehow your status of what you know is about how often you post. It has nothing to do with that. You could have one gecko and post 3,000 times. That doesn't make you an expert. So there are some negatives. I think the majority of forums are very, very positive, but there's certainly some negatives. There's also a lot of politicking going on. There's something that I actually really dislike, and that's the BOI on, on Fauna Classifieds. And that's the Board of Inquiry. Inquiry. Now, the idea behind the Board of Inquiry is that if someone has a problem or is a bad person or gets scammed, and they post it on there and say, don't do business with this guy. And I think it's a great thing. That's awesome. 
The problem is, is that people have vendettas against people, and they just start posting crap about people for no reason. And then other people that love to start crap just jump on and start starting that. So sometimes, you know, sometimes the negatives, you know, are a problem, but they certainly don't outweigh the positive of forums, and they don't weigh out, outweigh the positive of the internet. So we've changed a lot of things in the way we we do, um, you know, business, obviously. And the fact of the matter is, is the net is here to stay, right? And, and if you're an old timer that's been around previous to the, the internet, and you decide you don't want to embrace the internet, it's going to lose. It's going to you know, the business is just going to move right past you. You've got to embrace the internet. And I think that the changes that have happened is really what has has culminated. How many people? I'm just curious. You know, how many people here heard about this society from the internet? A lot of people, probably. Well, at least 20 percent or so. So. In, in, no, I was just going to say a great example. I'm just going to point this out. A great example is Thomas. Thomas watched uh, uh, something from Justin Cabellica and from Brian, and it looped back into Reno, mm -hmm. and that's how they got hooked up during like one of the first meetings. It's yeah, and that's what I'm saying. It's it's crazy. it's really a fantastic thing, and, and we have to embrace it. And guys like me that preceded the internet, you can can appreciate the people that came before us. But we also have to embrace what we have and try to do it. And that's why we always are trying you know, to be on top of social media, on top of everything. Because really, I think that the, the, the reptile industry is just going to continue to expand because of this. But that's enough about the internet and that's that whole thing. Um, first off, I wanted to take your guys' questions about anything I've talked about. Also about you know, my collection, the, the show, anything to have to do with being a professional breeder for as long as I have, the, the peaks and valleys of it. I also want to add, you know, you, you, some of you guys are familiar with the Python band. How many people in here are familiar with the Python band that just happened? Okay, I, I've been really intricately involved in this process for about four years. You know, there's something that was called the NOI, which is a notice of inquiry, which is what the Fish and Wildlife has to do if they want to make an addition to the Lacey Act or a rule change to the Lacey Act. I was at the meeting when the Fish and Wildlife announced the NOI, and it was actually the meeting that started USR. So, so I've been involved with this for about four years, so I'm pretty good about what's going on. So I think I can answer your question. Maybe not as good as Andrew was going to, but certainly in that same milk. So we can talk about that too. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm here for as long as they, until they kick me out. So I can answer as many questions as you got on any of those topics. You want? You guys want to start off? Five minutes, friend. Five, really? <laughs> I, I do like 20 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. More magic after? Yeah, it was, that was good. Uh, <laughs> does anyone have any questions about anything that I talked about or the, the, the business or anything like that? Come on, you guys got to get in this. Go ahead. Well, I've been seeing a lot of petitions going around on Facebook and yep. whatnot about reversing it. What are the odds or the chances of it actually uh, let's, let's put it this way. The odds are probably more likely that we're going to you know, get hit by a nuclear bomb tonight. Uh, I mean, seriously, dead, you know, hey, I'm all about doing something, people, seriously. I think signing a petition is better than doing nothing. I think that's fantastic. But the fact of the matter is, is you tell me how many laws, or in this case, additions to laws, have been overturned because of a petition. And I'm going to tell you that it's probably been less than 0.1%. And let me just go further. The, the White House won't even acknowledge a petition until you get to 25,000 petitions signatures, okay? We haven't been able to get anywhere near 25,000 petitions. Now, you know, how many people are familiar with the, the recent SOPA and PIPA, which is the internet problem? They had over a million signatures in one day. Now that made, that made ground, okay? If we had a million people sign a petition, we may be able to make some, some headway. But the fact of the matter is, is that you're not talking about overturning the law or stopping a law in its face. The law is already there. Basically, to let you guys know, there was no new law, okay? It was a law called Lacey, which was developed way back about 50 years ago. And in, in, this, in, in Lacey, there were provisions to add species if they became indigenous, okay? And that's what happened, and the process was called the Notice of Inquiry, and they had to do a scientific and economic study on the damage of any animal in order to be able to add it to Lacey Act. So we're not talking about overturning it. Lacey is not going anywhere. Lacey is going to be there. What we want to do is try to get those animals off of Lacey Act that was just added on. And by the way, they were added last week. They're in the registry. It's 100% done. There's no turning back, okay? So now the only thing that we could really do if we want to stop this process, we can we can go through and try to do petitions, but honestly, this is not going to work. And the other problem is, is that, we, like you were saying, how many petitions have we seen? 
You know, there hasn't been one petition, there's been 10 petitions, which means if we can't get to 25,000 with one, how are we gonna get to 25,000 with 10 of them? You know? So anyways, the only way we can stop this law at this point is to file an injunction against the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the, the DOJ uh, to stop the addition to Lacey. The problem with that is, is uh, go ahead. If at some point you could just cover what what is it? What has been? Okay, added? let me yeah, let me back up here. Yeah, okay, Burmese pythons, yellow anacondas, and the two species of rock python have been added to the Lacey Act. That basically means that you can keep those animals in this state, but they can never leave this state. Okay, so if you need to move. You can't take your snake. If you produce babies, you cannot sell them out of this state. But you can keep them here, okay? So they're not taking your snake away from you. You can still keep your pet snake. But heaven forbid, I see some military guard there, heaven forbid you have a Burmese and you get transferred out of the state to another base, your Burm ain't coming with you, you know? So you can serve our country, but you can't keep your snake, you know? So this is a pretty major thing, and that's what happened. And, and the reason they did this was because of the invasive species issue in South Florida. Now, what basically happened is we all agree that South Florida has a Burmese issue, okay? How bad it is is a whole different thing. You know, some people say it's 3,000, some people say it's 300,000. We don't know. I mean, the people I know down there on the ground tell me it's probably not nearly as bad as most people think it is. But there's definitely still an invasive species problem in the South Florida area. The problem is, is it's only in South Florida. It's nowhere else. So what did Florida do? Florida passed legislation for, on a statewide level that made you have to permit your animal and microchip your animal. And what they wanted to do was stop people from releasing them into the wild. So if you have a microchip in your animal and you have a permit and that animal shows up in the Everglades, you're in deep shit. Or poop, sorry. I got emotional. Um, um, can you edit that out there, please? Um, so, so anyway, you're a team so that, that seems to work, right? I mean, so okay, the animals in the Everglades, it stinks and, and we gotta somehow get rid of them. But no more are gonna be back in the Everglades because we now have a permit system with microchips that's gonna stop the, the, the release of these animals, right? Well, <coughs> unfortunately, the federal government thought that we should ban them from the entire country. Even though me coming from Michigan, I know Burmese are ever going to live in Michigan, right? I mean, come on. You know, they, as a matter of fact, there was a study in South Carolina, which is a lot warmer than Michigan, by the way, uh, that they released 10 Burmese pythons in an 8 foot by 10 foot cage outside, in, or not 8 foot, 80 foot by 100 foot, so a pretty big cage. Uh, they released them outside, all 10 died in December and January. Okay? So they couldn't even get as far north as South Carolina, let alone. Georgia, you know, I mean, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't even live in North Florida. They can all live in South Florida, but yet the Fish and Wildlife decided to pass the, the, the rule change based on completely ridiculous, uh, a ridiculous uh, paper from the USGS that was written by a guy named Rhoda um, that basically said that if, get this, if the climate change, the climatological forecast of global warming happened over the next hundred years, Burmese pythons could migrate out of Florida. So if there's a global warming of, a problem in, say, Michigan gets to 80 degrees in the summertime, we're going to have a problem with Burmese in Michigan. But, you know, yeah, but we might have a lot bigger problem if it's 80 degrees in Michigan, right? So that's what basically happened. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like, are you freaking kidding me? Can that possibly happen? But it's really what happened. They took this ridiculous climatological forecast and basically passed rule change based on that alone. You know, because we all agree that only Florida has a problem. Even the U.S. Fish and Wildlife agrees only Florida has a problem. The FWC, which is the Florida Wildlife Commission, they agree it's only a South Florida problem. But yet the federal government decided to pass it into federal legislation. So as of now, 60 days, well now 50-something days from now, Burmese pythons, rock pythons, and yellow anacondas will no longer ever be able to be transported <coughs> out of state line or be imported. Quick question just on that. Uh, what are the chances, if I'm going across state line, that I got a Tupperware container in my backseat, you know, I pop it open, you know, what, uh, what's your, I don't know. Well, you know, this is, a, this goes back to a, a good, that's a great point, by the way. And, and it basically comes to, how is it enforceable? Are, are they going to have checkpoints at every state line checking for Burmese pythons? Of course not. <laughs> 
You know, it's an unenforceable law. You know, you can't enforce that type of law. And you know, they won't be checking. They won't at all. But let me tell you what, if somehow you get caught, you will be in major trouble and potentially even face jail time. Okay? This isn't just, this isn't just a, a little problem. You know, the Lacey Act violation can be up to a five-year prison term. Okay? If you knowingly, willingly break the Lacey Act law, you can get up to five years in jail for it. At bare minimum, you're looking at a $1,500 fine, okay? And what's going to happen is, yeah, they're not going to find someone like, hey, did this come from Michigan? That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is there's going to be standards <coughs> by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife that basically say, you know, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so took this snake from Michigan to Ohio, and then they're going to figure it out, and then they're going to bust you for it. And that's how this stuff happens. So, so, yeah, I mean, theoretically, if you took a pet snake, you know, across state lines, you're probably not going to get caught. But you're still breaking the law. It doesn't matter if you're going to get caught or not. You're still potentially putting yourself at risk, and, and it's, it, you shouldn't have to do that. Go ahead. So as a perp society, I know that when we went to Sacramento, Arizona had brought a bunch of snakes up from Arizona as a display piece, an educational piece for people there. Will it stop a society like this on an educational process to take a berm to California or something or that type of... Uh, well, fortunately, there's a provision in the Lacey Act that is about education, okay? You have to get an educational permit in order to do that. A herb society probably has a relatively good chance. Um, it's going to be a lot of paperwork, it's going to be a lot of red tape, but you're probably going to be able to attain that if you're willing to do it, okay? Um, an individual that says do, does educational shows, like I do sometimes, uh, as a matter of fact, I was supposed to have one in, in uh, Chicago this weekend, and I'm going from Michigan, I go through Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Chicago, and I take big snakes with me, because obviously when you're doing educational shows, that's a cool thing to bring along. This would have been the last one I could ever do, because I would never be able to do it again in the future. And the chances of me getting a permit on an educational level is, is probably next to nothing. So there is provisions for zoos, there's provisions for scientific study, and there are provisions for education, but they're not going to hand those permits out like, like candy on Halloween, I can guarantee you that. Go ahead. Do you know that when they came up with this law, was there any consideration for the fact that an albino Burmese couldn't exist in South Florida, that the sun would burn it up, or that it couldn't camouflage it enough? To These were a lot of arguments that the herb community brought up. You know, the viability of, of how much the pet trade had influenced the South Florida problem. And, um, and I think that everyone agreed that there was never an albino Burmese python caught, although there were some staged albino Burmese pythons caught in the Everglades, staged by certain people, like some TV shows and stuff like that. Uh, that but there was no bad. actual albino Burmese caught in the Everglades. But that being said, um, again, I go back to the fact that, yes, I, you know, it, it, as, as a herd community, if we sit back and say, there is no way anyone has ever released a Burmese python in the Everglades. That would be kind of silly, don't you think? I mean, I am sure some idiot released Burmese pythons. In there. Maybe even albino Burmese pythons. Yeah, they probably die because of, you know, burning their retinas out and so on like that. But the point is, is that I'm sure it happened. But there's a lot of people that feel that the vast majority of the problem came from zoos and other breeding facilities that were wiped out during Hurricane Andrew. Okay, because all those, those animals got pushed into the Everglades. And there were huge facilities, including a lot of zoological, that lost all of their stock during Hurricane Andrew. Those animals just disappeared. And just to let you guys know, I mean, the Everglades is a crazy place. There's not just Burmese pythons down there. There's chimpanzees down there. There's a group of king cobras down there. There's been, you know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. The Everglades is overrun with invasive species. What's really interesting is there's a couple plants in the Everglades that are considered the most invasive, you know, thing in the Everglades. And guess who released them? The U.S. government did it to try to help with swampland. Okay, but you know they don't put them on the Lacey Act. You see what I'm saying? Basically. What really happened here was that you had special interest groups like the HSUS, Defenders.org, and some of these other associations that basically have a no pet snake agenda. They don't want to keep any snakes. They don't want to keep a corn snake, a king snake, a ball python, no snakes at all. And they basically pushed their agenda into the right people's hands to say, let's pass this. You know, they tried to pass laws like HR 669. S-373, that was going to do the same thing as a law, but they couldn't get it done because senators and congressmen wouldn't stand behind it because of the uprising in the community and how much it would hurt the economy. So what they did was they said, well, you know what we can do? We can just add them to Lacey. 
We just have to find the right person to willing to do it. And unfortunately, the director of the Fish and Wildlife, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Ken Salazar, was their guy. Okay, and he he made it happen. And uh, and that's that's kind of what happened. Now now you know. We're talking a lot about big snakes. We're talking about berms. We're talking about things that are kind of scary and stuff like that. But don't think that ball pythons are not on their radar, okay? Because ball pythons are probably 80% of what the pet trade is right now, okay? About 80% of the financial money that comes into the pet trade has to be attached to ball pythons. And you know, Rhoda, who's the one that wrote the USGS report that got the institution of the rule change, okay? His number one species of concern for invasiveness beyond Burmese pythons was ball pythons. Same guy. So you think they're not going to come after ball pythons, you're wrong. That's why we have to make a stand. We as a community have to figure out a way to stop this. You know, it can't be, we can't push no snake agendas into actual law that has nothing to do with it. Again, they talked about, you know, the, the population was in danger. Well, you know what? <clears throat> Lacey isn't about who's in danger. It isn't about the, the guy in Ohio that gets killed by a reticulated python. It has nothing to do with the Lacey Act. That has to do with invasive species only, okay? And, and so, so, you know, it's, it's a little cloudy when you say, oh, well, yeah, but ball pythons don't hurt anybody, or ball pythons won't ever do anything. Well, you know what? It's not about that. It's about invasiveness, and we have to be really careful. Go ahead. No, with, <coughs> with the knowledge you have with the laws, um, what is the chance that you've got individual states that can then override and allow permits in and or out and even tack on size limitations or size permit? Um, well, the state thing is a, is a scary thing because they're not going to go that way. They're not going to go for us. They're going to go against us, okay? States can't override federal law. You know, people might be familiar with marijuana legalization, you know? That's illegal. You know, a state can't make marijuana legal when the federal government says it's illegal. Okay, mm -hmm. they can tolerate it, but you can still get busted for growing marijuana, even if you're in a legal state and you have a permit to do it. So I don't think states are going to allow Burmese pythons and allow things. Now the scary thing that's happening right now is that you guys did everyone hear about like what happened in Ohio, Zanesville, where the tigers got loose, the guy killed himself, and <coughs> the tigers running all over the place. And, they killed them all and all that craziness happened. Well, Ohio, the governor of Ohio uh, was, was like, we have to pass a law because he looks pretty silly, right? What happened was there was actually a law that was going to outlaw some of these tigers and auctions and a bunch of other stuff that the governor prior to him, just before leaving, instituted, okay? It was a governor, governor action. And, and when uh, the new governor came in, he wiped it out. Then all of a sudden, you know, which was good for us because he saved reptiles, he saved animals, all this other stuff. Then this thing happened, he got major egg on his face, right? Now he's got to do some damage control. He's got to pass a law because everyone thinks that he's the one that basically caused this problem. <coughs> if he would have just kept the government act in place, we wouldn't have had this, you know, Zanesville incident, right? Do you have a question? Yeah. No. Well, uh, yeah, so, so anyways, my point is that Ohio decided to start implementing a law that would be a ban of some sort. They're still working on it. Unfortunately, right after that, Indiana picked up on the law, a law that is going to be banning snakes. Now, now, we're not talking about you can keep your pet snake, you just can't transfer our start to state lines. These laws are saying you have 60 days to register your snake, and then you have till January 4, 2014 to get rid of your snake. You cannot allow them in the state, period not allowed in the state. And as a matter of fact, Indiana, the initial draft, which hopefully will get obviously downplayed to some extent, the initial draft was all boas, okay? So we're talking about Kenyan sand boas, children's pythons, carpet pythons, ball pythons, boa constrictors, all boas. That was what Indiana was. Now there's, there's talk of, of Pennsylvania, and just yesterday Rhode Island said they were going to pass something. So this is on a statewide level is really scary because it's spreading. And what happened was with this federal ban, this quote unquote ban of pythons, it's caused state people to jump on board and say, oh my gosh, I've gotta, we, we gotta pass this because these snakes are terrible for us. And of course, it's all pushed by HSUS and the special interest groups that are pushing the, the people with huge you know, donations to their campaigns to push their agenda. As a matter of fact, HSUS was really upset that the federal government took five of the nine species off the list that were supposed to go on to Lacey. So they weren't happy that they only got four, they wanted all nine, including boa constrictors, by the way. Did you 
what is the government uh, saying that we have to do with the snakes then? Like, so we can't transport them, we can't keep them. What are we supposed to do? Well, first off, it's an interesting concept because if, if let's say, this Lacey is there, okay, and we don't, for some reason we can't follow the judge, which by the way is going to cost about $150,000, okay? So we have to somehow come up with one hundred and fifty grand just to really get the ball rolling. This has to go through, you know, state courts, federal courts, ultimately to the Supreme Court before it can actually be overturned and, and those animals off of Lacey. Now, if, if, if let's say Indiana bans, or Ohio bans Burmese pythons, let's just use them as an example, and we can't transport them across state lines because Lacey, you have no choice but to kill them, period. That's what's going to happen. You have no choice but to euthanize them because you can't sell them, you can't ship them, you can't take them across state lines, so you get, and you've got to get rid of them. So that's my whole point is that this law is going to cause tens of thousands of snakes to die an unneeded death. And, and I don't think that the, 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 the politicians understand that, and they need to understand that. We have to do a better job of teaching them the right thing. I'm sorry, I'm, I forgot. How do you think this is going to affect your business and pet stores and the reptile business industry? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, me personally, it's not going to affect my business that much because I don't do a lot with big snakes. But I'm a big advocate for protecting everybody's <coughs> ability to keep these animals. Okay? But, but again, it's a slippery slope. The problem that some people I have right now with some of the community is that they're not that motivated to help the big snake people. Because all they do is keep small snakes. But you know, if we throw the big snakes under the bus, they're going to come after the small snakes, and then we're going to, we're going to be in big, big trouble. Do they, uh, I've been in the, this hobby since the 70s, and, so you were and way before some of this. <laughs> and we used to have uh, you know, different laws come up for things, but there was PJAC, the yep. uh, pet trade pet, thing. Are they still, do they still? Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council. They used to be, everybody would say support them because right. they would fight all this kind of... Uh... PJAC is still fighting, and PJAC is another organization. There's really two major organizations that are on our side. There's some smaller ones like Rixana and a few others, but, but you have PJAC and you have USR. USARC is the United States Association for Reptile mm -hmm. Keepers. They, they, they are for reptiles alone, okay? PJAC is, is for everything. It's the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council. They, they take care of all pets. And, and, and PJAC has been involved in every battle. They're involved in Ohio. They're involved in Indiana. They're involved in Rhode Island. They're involved, oh, I forgot Virginia, by the way, where Andrew is, I guess, now. Uh, Virginia's got a law pending, too. So, uh, but PJAC's involved as well. But, but again, they're protecting the entire pet trade, whereas USARC is very specific. So. I support both organizations, I really do, but I think USR needs to take the lead in the reptile side of it. Does that make sense? Um, anyone else want to hear me just complain for the next 20 minutes? <laughs> Go ahead. What I'm understanding from this is that an appointed body, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, has made an administrative ruling. You're pretty With right their power uh, provided to them by Congress. Yes. So they essentially have managed to do this, do this without going through the legislative process. Exactly. And, and that, exactly. Because Lacey has a provision that they can do it without getting congressional approval. You know? And I think you have correctly assessed this in saying that this is not a situation where you can say to the people that keep big snakes, you're into the boat is sinking. Right. We don't have big snakes. We don't have to worry. This is not. Uh, this kind of problem is not unique to the pet uh, interest or pet segment of society. There are other areas that suffer the same kind of thing, where Congress passes laws and gives various uh, bodies, uh, non-elected bodies, the power to interpret or come up with the uh, implementing language for legislation. Yeah. And it's a, a greatly abused power. I agree with you a thousand percent. And most of the, the these travesties at least are backed by organizations like the NRA, Cattlesmen Association, if you name it like that, that can fight these processes and say it's wrong. You can't make administrative changes to something without congressional <coughs> approval. And they fight them. Unfortunately, we're a small, small group of people, and we've had a hard time coming up with the 25,000 petitions, let alone $150,000, above 
fighting all these other laws. You got to remember, it's not just 150. It's fighting Ohio. It's fighting Indiana. You know, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is, I, I, <clears throat> I know people fighting some of these other laws in other areas. In general, it takes a huge commitment mm -hmm. to get anywhere. Yeah. Because what you're dealing with is a pressure group, whether it's HSUS or maybe there may be some others working with them. But still, you've got a well-funded pressure group that can afford to finance enough junk science to give them uh, cover for anybody that goes or votes their way. One thousand percent. To, to, to fight this, you need to debunk their junk science. And that's a huge undertaking in itself. We've tried, though, and but no one listened. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying I've seen it done in other areas. Yep. But it's a huge project. It is a huge project, and as a matter of fact, when you talk about funding, just to give you guys an example, PJAC, it, which is, is about 10 times larger because they're the whole pet trade than U.S. ARC, Marshall Myers, who ran PJAC, told me once that HSUS's postal budget was more than the entire intake that PJAC got. Think about that. They have a bigger postal budget than PJAC has budget completely. Okay, so that gives you an idea of who we're fighting. They have deep pockets. They brought in about $200 million last year in donations. And they do it under the guise of we love puppies and we do this. And actually, if, if you ever dig into HSUS, and please people, use the internet to dig into the HSUS, you will see their stance is anti-animal capture. Okay, and that means they look at captivity like your dog in your backyard. Okay, if you have a dog in your backyard, they consider that captivity. They don't want you to have your dog. They don't want you to have your cat. They don't want to have any animal in captivity, including your, you know, I hope you don't like hamburgers or, or hot dogs or whatever else, because they don't want that either. They don't want any food. They don't want any dogs, cats, anything. And unfortunately, hundreds of millions of dollars are going to that organization on the guise that they're animal lovers. Okay? Yeah, got a question? Um. This isn't about the thing that you were talking about, but... Um, oh, it's okay. I'm here for whatever you want. Okay, I was just wondering if, um, if, um, if you've ever, um, like, shipped the animal to, like, a different continent mm -hmm. or something? Yeah, the question was, did I ship an animal to a different continent? All the time. We do a lot of business all over the world. I've shipped, um, you know, to Europe a ton, all over Asia. We've shipped uh, all over the place. I have never shipped to Antarctica. But uh, I don't know if there's much of a call for snakes there. And that's a good question, though. It really is. Go ahead. So you talk a lot about the problem and then the national, what we're fighting against nationally. Can you speak to what we can do as a community at Perk Lovers and what we can do to change the mindset of the people <coughs> that just don't know what the problem is? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we just did a, a, a quick video. This, this, that'll be out at some point about what, what herb societies are all about. And, it's, and one of the things was education, okay? And I think as a herb society, it's very imperative that you guys are really the grassroots part of this whole effort. You're educating people, okay? In the sense that you can do whatever you can do to change your mind. I think that the, the real battle to be won here isn't with legislation or Congress or anything, because we all know right now there's something broke in our country, right? Our, our, you know, congressmen listening to what we have to say, hell no, they're, they don't care what we have to say. You know, they're, they're, it just doesn't work that way anymore. What we have to do is fight the public opinion battle, in my opinion, okay? Because the HSUS is doing a great job, and I'm just not, I'm just using them as an example. There's a whole host of, of, of organizations that are on their side are doing a great job of painting snakes in particular as, as the, they're fear mongering. You know, they're going to kill you, they're going to do this, they're going to eat your dog, they're going to do that. And they're doing a great, great job of it, right? And we're doing a terrible <coughs> job, in my opinion, of telling the truth, okay? These snakes, I mean, come on, I, one death is too many. Let me just start there. But there's been, I think, seven or eight deaths in the last 50 years attributed to constricting snakes, okay? Now, now look up horse statistics, look up dog statistics, look up, you know, Cattle, you name it. I bet you there's been more sheep killed people than there have white them. You know, it, 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 but they, you know, they've done a tremendous job of, of, of painting that picture. And we, as a herd community, and 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 specifically societies, have to do a great job of being the, the, the soldiers. 
We gotta be out there being a soldier, changing people's minds on, the, on the, that level. Because that's something that no big organization, USR can do one thing, they can fight laws. You know, yeah, they can put out PR. Absolutely, they can do that. But it's going to be you guys and guys like me that are out here on the street working hard to change people's perspective on it. And if people start to see that these snakes aren't monsters, maybe they'll stand up when they go, why would you pan? This is, this is the problem, guys. And I'm going to take some more questions. But this is the problem. And, and I'd love to, I'm, I'm going to ask this question to you because if someone can answer this, I'd like to know. Okay, what's the argument for keeping an 18-foot python? Does anyone have an argument? They're happy to disappear in the natural where they come from. They're so afraid that the Everglades are going to get run over, and where they come from, they're nearly extinct. That is, I, I agree with you. I think that's a decent thing, but I think it's really difficult to sell that to someone next door with an 18 foot python. Do you see what I'm saying? That's a hard, hard <laughs> argument. I've been keeping 18 foot pythons since I was 15 years old, and okay. it's a very hard argument to articulate, right? But it's a very easy argument to make against it. So we're fighting an uphill battle. You know, we, I mean, snakes is, is in general have been considered evil since the Garden of Eden. You know what I mean? It's like we have an uphill battle changing people's positions, right? So, so it's very difficult, and, and, and it's not going to be easy. But it's going to have to be something that happens on the grassroots level, just like everyone in here. Because honestly, the downside is I see a lot of kids in here that are reptile lovers. You guys aren't going to be able to keep reptiles when you're my age, you know, if this keeps going down this direction, you know. And that's just something that I just can't live with. I will fight till my dying breath to make sure that this does not happen. Go ahead. Is there uh, some form of a, a list or uh, something that, that might have been a website that you can access that says this legislator or this political person or whatever supports such groups or supports reptile groups? So as we cast our votes in November, we might have a little better idea of who to or who not to vote. You know, it's a good question. Uh, Justin? Yes. I'm sorry, do you have any idea if US ARC or anyone else has compiled a list like that? He was saying like a list of, of, of Congress that support or don't yeah, support. Yeah, there, there is a list that went around with all the numbers and addresses. I, and what their stance that. was? Uh, <coughs> I am not a stance. Right. I can make those okay. calls, though. I think that's a it would be a great thing to have. If we do that when we're in November, it'd be you know a little bit easier to throw a vote. And it is interesting. There's actually it's funny you said that Virginia's facing a really tough law right now. Uh, U.S. Ark is on that right now. And, and I actually found out through a friend of a friend uh, that we got in contact with one of the state senators that keeps venomous reptiles as pets. So it's pretty cool to have that as our battle to ride. So we're reaching out to him and hoping that he can help us with the state. And he's, he's already said that <coughs> and the response back was he will not support any law that prohibits people from keeping these exotic animals. It's but we need more than that. Than right, exactly. And, and, and I agree with you. We need, we need a list that I know what to vote for, you know? And, hey, NRA, like we were talking before, NRA has a list, right? You know, you know they're, they're organized. And we have to do a better job of that for sure. Yes, sir. One of the problems is that in any pressure group like NRA or any others, where they have, they're organized, yada, yada, yada. But just like you can grade the people of the pressure groups opposing, you can grade your help too. Right. Because many of them will say, yeah, I don't believe in that, but they won't get out and do anything. And others will do a little bit, but not very much. And some like you maybe will go the whole nine yards. But the, the problem is how many will do how much. Right. Well, that's always the case. You know, I mean, again, 25,000 petitions is what we needed. Not, not even signed petitions. <coughs> Click here and fill in your name. We couldn't get there. You know, 25,000 in the whole country. Go ahead. Uh, you said before that it's going to be pretty impossible to get Lacey overturned at all, but how likely is it to get those snakes that are put on the list to be removed? I think if we can file a civil injunction on that Lacey, I think we would be in court, absolutely. Because, like you were saying, bad science. It was ridiculous. It, you know, for, in a court of law, there is no way that the road of paper will hold up. Impossible. If we can fight this to the Supreme Court, I will guarantee you we will overturn it. Guaranteed. So is there a, a company or anything collecting donations for this $150,000? USR. Okay. USR. They're the ones that are going to be backing it. We need to push money towards them. 
you know, they're the ones that are going to file the injunction. They're the ones that are going to take it right to the Supreme Court. They're going to hire, you know, lobbyists. They're going to hire attorneys. And that's the, that's the company that we need to back. Is there any sign of the smaller government entities, cities, counties, arising up and coming up with similar laws that are restrictive in the home? It's happening at all. Who just was telling me about this today? Um, gosh, who just told me about this? Were you there when someone was just talking about a county? Were you guys talking about something like a local county was trying to pass? Who, who it was, was it? Right, was it right there. What was the story? Oh, as far as locally? Yeah, was it so? <coughs> we were trying to uh, change the ordinances to where... Right, yeah, yeah. You had to be a like pet-friendly neighborhood or something yeah, like that. Yeah, right? yeah, it was a... Uh, non-congested area. Yeah, a yeah. non-animal congested yeah. area, yeah, which so was, it was about 95% of the... Just a congested area. Well, and, and the thing yeah. is, though, is that, in all honesty, counties and cities are usually pretty easy to fight these types of things because it's usually a lack of education by the council member members. And a lot of times it's just a matter of getting the right people's ears and teaching them that it's not what you think it is. Again, it, it's, yeah. the, it's the 800 pound gorilla in the, in, the, in the living room, you know? But I'm coming from, a, from a, a little different perspective because I'm here for my son. He used to raise rabbits. Hmm. And so I talk to a lot of rabbit breeders. He needs a Burmese pipe then. then. But rabbit breeders are having a very difficult time mm -hmm. where they're having to go further and further and further out in a rural area. Some right. some cities won't even allow any. Right. So and yet that's a little fluffy bunny rabbit. Well that's the that's the problem. I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's you know if you can't get a, a bunny rabbit to, to, to be legal, it's hard to fight the battle of a snake. Yeah. You know? And uh, and, and that is our problem. But, but I my experience has been is if you get a good group like like this group of people, I'm telling you, if, if someone in Reno was gonna pass a law, if this amount of people showed up at a meeting, it would make an influence. You know, it, it seriously would. Um, okay, a couple more, and then we got to wrap up because you got you got school in the morning. <laughs> no, you don't. Know, what day is it, anyways? I can't remember. The day. Go ahead. Um, the petition. I actually went to one of the websites. That people went to one of the websites that had the government petition started. You can't just click and sign in. You actually have to register, put in personal information, right. and then you can have your name attached to it. Right. So if you were willing to go through all of that. Right. But the other thing is that. Um, what it sounds like it needs to happen is what you have done exactly with Snake, Snake Bite TV is get to those other people that aren't in this community that are broad, broad spectrum. Right. You have the same concept, but now it needs to go. Well, I totally agree. Further. Because like I said, I've said this a million times. I've, I've been, you know, Justin's probably sick of hearing me say this. We as an industry do a, a terrible job of, of out, getting outside of ourselves. We meet as a group like this, and then we talk amongst each other. But we don't have a good mechanism of reaching people outside of people that are interested in reptiles, okay? And I think that we need to continue to do that. Again, snake bites is one of the things we've tried to do. We're working on some TV stuff right now that we hope that will reach a lot more people. Um, we, me and Justin have been working on Snake Awareness Day, which is going to be an educational day. You know, going to schools like on a specific day to do a presentation, an educational presentation. And if we can get a few thousand people across the country that, that, that are willing to do it, we can get some national media attention. And then people are going to be like, oh, these Snake people are great. They're going to take in all these kids and they're learning. So, okay, last one. Go ahead. Are, is there any support? For I'll, like, I'll do one quick one. <laughs> okay. Is there any support from like the big herpetological uh, the scientific uh, Scientific communities, they don't care about no, I, pet owners. A lot of the scientific community is behind us. They're probably not going to be as vocal as some, but a lot of scientists went after the Rota paper yeah. really heavily. They went after it. And, and uh, so, so, yeah, we have the herb community, the scientific herb community behind us, mainly because there was no peer-reviewed study on the Rota paper, which is something that you have to do to have a <coughs> scientific paper. It has to be peer-reviewed. Last question. Uh, has anyone approached Bear Grylls yet? Well, seeing as he loves to kill kill animals, I doubt that he would probably be a, a good guy. Uh, the problem, honestly, I, I, I make light of that. But I, I, number one, I don't think he cares about animals. I don't see anything to, to tell me he would. There are other celebrities out there that I think would be great to go after. You know, there's and some some of them we've already talked to. I talked with you guys. I don't know if you guys watch 
auction hunters on, on uh, Spike TV, but uh, I talked a ton today, uh, and, and you know, he's on board helping the fight, you know, and, and there's other guys, you know, Kerry King from Slayer, and, and Slash from Guns N' Roses, and or, or Velvet Revolver, and a bunch, of, there's a whole bunch of other guys. We, we, what I'm really trying to do is get, there's a couple really big names that I'm not going to mention that we're looking at right now that, you know, that I'm talking like mega movie stars that have kept reptiles and we're trying to get to them. But, you know, there's a lot of layers to get to those type of people. But, but, uh, but anyways, guys, number one, I want to thank everyone for dealing with my rambling for the last hour and a half. Um, I hope I, I fulfilled. I'm going to be here if you guys want to talk to me for the next, however, until they kick me out personally, come up and talk to me. You can grab my email address or anything if you have questions. <coughs> And anything I can do for you guys, but thank you so much for being a part of this Herb Society. You guys are so important to the future of the hobby, and just thank you for being such gracious hosts to me. I appreciate it.